Hello, this is Hallie Stephen Castro. I'm going to do a lecture on the cardiovascular and peripheral vascular assessment. It will be done in two different lectures. I'm just going to do the cardiovascular first. Then we'll move on to the peripheral vascular. <clears throat> All right. Um, of course, we're going to ask any type of history related to cardiac issues. And there's some specific questions with cardiac problems um, or cardiac symptoms that we'd want to address. The first would be chest pain. And remember, um, we discussed kind of a pain scale or getting more details about a pain scale uh, back in the first module. If they do have chest pain, it's really important to find out how what kind of chest pain they're experiencing to ask additional questions. Like, is it sharp? Is it dull? How does it feel? Does it feel like a crushing is it pressure? Does it radiate anywhere to their arm, to their jaw, to their back? Um, is it come and go? Is it constant? What makes it worse? What makes it better? Ask a series of questions. And of course, you're always going to have a company, company that with your pain scale. <clears throat> and, um, other associated symptoms, excuse me, maybe the nausea, vomiting, sweating, if they feel like they're having palpitations or like their heart's fluttering. Um, we can ask if their heart ever feels like it's pounding too fast or if it feels like it's skipping a beat. Sometimes it feels like it has flutters in their chest. Um, other associated associated symptoms it says do you experience dizziness um and if you think about it why would we associate dizziness with uh cardiac problems if the heart's not beating effectively that means that the blood's not being um effectively pumped to all the tissues of the body including the organs and the brain and that may result in some neurological or some dizziness uh, type of symptoms swollen ankles we can associate that to cardiac issues um, and again not all swollen ankles are due to cardiac problems but some might be um, if the heart's not pumping effectively again um, sometimes there gets a backflow of fluid and it usually rests in the lower extremities um, do you tire easily? Um, and that has to do with like with activity. Um, <clears throat> again, if the heart is not, let me take one little sip of water here. Hold on one second. Pa pa <clears throat> I apologize. I think my allergies are getting to me this morning. So again, um, do we tire or does your client tire easily? Um, sometimes with activity or even without activity with people with cardiac issues or cardiac disease, um, the part, heart is not pumping effectively, and again, that's pumping oxygen to all the organs, the brains, the tissues of the body, and if you're not getting that oxygen supply, um, it's going to make th that person clot tired. Um, do you sleep with extra pillows at night? Um, again, with heart failure, sometimes we have to have the head of the bed elevated because it's hard for them to sleep flat on their back um, because sometimes fluid um, can build up overnight, <clears throat> so it's easier if they sit up in the bed. There's kind of gravity at work. <clears throat> All right. Um, other additional questions include: um, Have you been diagnosed with a heart murmur or heart defect? We're going to talk about murmurs here. This is a slide um, a little bit later. Have you had any changes, uh, problems with hypertension, or that's high blood pressure, or any pain in your calves or legs? Do you smoke? A smoking history is going to be across the board. Um, obviously, smoke has a smoking has a high coincidence of cardiovascular disease and also pulmonary disease. Have you ever had a blood test called a lipid profile? Um, we like to see if we can get a nice baseline um, of our client's lipid profiles if we're doing a thorough cardiac assessment. The lipid profile is basically kind of the cholesterol levels. So that's when you're going to look at the triglycerides and their HDL and their LDL. Um, <clears throat> remember, really high fatty diets can relate to um, high cholesterol in the bloodstream, which can leave fatty deposits and lead to a cardiovascular disease. Um, do you suffer from heartburn? And why do we ask about heartburn? Um, well, many, many times, probably more times than I can count, I've had clients in the ER that actually were having a, a myocardial infarction or a heart attack when they thought they were just having acid reflux. Um, because sometimes, even though the textbook cases of car myocardial infarction do not feel like heartburn, um, most studies have been done on white male 
men roughly in the ages about 55 to 65 to 75 in that age range. They didn't do a lot of testing or a lot of um, data collection on females, people of color, and people with underlying other, other underlying health issues such as diabetes. Um, when you have those things, um, women, people of color, and certainly people with diabetes, experience their pain a little bit different than the average white male from the ages of 55 to 75. So we want to just make sure that they're not masking any type of pain that they might thought think was heartburn and that it might be something else. So that's again, that's why we always like to ask those additional questions. If they do say they've had pain, ask them what does their pain feel like, you know, all those series of questions, the cold spa or whatever a mnemonic we like to use. I like to use the PQRST mnemonic for pain, but um, that's, I think we already addressed that in module one. <clears throat> the equipment that you need for your cardiovascular assessment is going to be your stethoscope. And I just want to kind of point this out. This shows the bell side up. It's a small disc. There's no film over it, over the top of it. It's got one single tube uh, right here, one tube here, and it goes to the biannuals bi bi and then your um, earpiece is at the top. A Doppler is optional. Obviously, we're not going to be using a Doppler this summer um, or we usually we don't have a Doppler in class anyway, but they do carry Dopplers in the clinical area. Um, sometimes with our geriatric clients, it is difficult to feel for pulses, um, particularly the lower extremity pulses in the feet. If they have peripheral vascular disease, it can impede a pulse. Even though they do have a pulse, it's so faint, it's difficult to feel. So sometimes we have to use a Doppler to ensure that there's a nice pulse there. Um, <clears throat> that will be a skill that you'll learn in clinical. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind. The techniques that we're going to use is an inspection. And remember, this comes right off of your respiratory or thorax assessment. You're going to inspect the posterior, or you finish the posterior respiratory, you go to the anterior respiratory, perform your assessment, and then um, once you're done with that, you just move right into the cardiac. You're standing right there. So you go ahead and do your inspection. Um, we'll do some palpation, typically at the cardiac sites. We will not percuss. Um, there really is no percussion for the cardiac assessment. And we will then auscultate. So under inspection, we, we need to look at the color tones of the skin, um, and particularly the face. It should be nice and uniform with pink undertones. It shows that they're getting good, good, good blood supply and that they're being nice and perfused. Any type of grayish undertones might be a result of having some coronary artery disease or that there are some perfusion issues. Um, we're going to inspect those jugular veins, and those are the veins in the neck. Um, we would like to have the client seated, just kind of away from us, sitting up, and we're going to look for any type of distension. And distension means that they kind of like, or they stick out a little bit, or a little bit more, they're more pronounced. Um, <clears throat> normally, they are not visible. Um, normally, you would not be able to see the veins, but sometimes um, with people that have had some cardiac disease, um, particularly heart failure or fluid volume issues, um, in some geriatric clients, you can actually see the jugular veins a little bit more pronounced than um, an, an average and healthy adult. So you would have them, um, if you're assessing the right side of the jugular, the right jugular vein, you'd have them put their left ear to their left shoulder and kind of look at that area to see if there's any distension with the vein on the right side and vice versa. If you're looking at the left jugular vein, have them put their right ear to their right shoulder and just kind of look at the neck and see if you can see any jugular veins. Um, <clears throat> again, that would indicate that there might be extra fluid, more pressure on the vena cava, which causes those veins to bulge out um, and those and uh, fluid overload. And while you're looking at the neck, we're going to go ahead and look at the carotid arteries at the same time. Again, the client should be sitting at 45 degree angle or sitting up, and we're just going to kind of look for any type of pulsations. 
<clears throat> again, uh, sorry, I had to take a pause the video for a second. Um, you're going to have them sitting at 45 degrees, which is sitting up in a chair, and you're going to observe any pulsations again in the neck on the right side and on the left side. They should be visible bilaterally, but just barely. Um, and if you don't see them, that's okay. Sometimes they're not visible. Um, so, but if you do, it should just be barely, slightly visible. Um, they should not be bounding. Frequently, again, with people that have heart failure or cardiovascular disease, the heart's working so hard that you can actually see the pulsation in the neck from um, the heart beating, um, from working so hard. If it says the pulsations are absent, there may be obstruction of the artery. Um, again, usually that's something that might, would be more um, on the palpation. <clears throat> All right, we're going to look at the venous pattern on the chest. It should just be nice and evenly, evenly distributed. If you see anything that's dilated, or distended, or uh, contorted, um, similar to like what this gentleman has over in this photo, which is pretty severe, um, there might be some type of obstructive process in the um, vascular system. So we're just gonna just inspect the chest there. Um, pulsations or heaves. You're just going to look at the chest, particularly in the area of where the heart sits on the left side, and you're going to inspect it for any type of pulsations, and then you're going to just lightly palpate each of the five cardiac areas, and I'm going to go over those with you here in just a second. Again, there really should be no pulsations or heaves anywhere in that cardiac area except at the mitral area, and there might be a slight pulsation there. Um, it would be a very light pulse, and a heave is when it's really lifting. Um, <clears throat> we should have them either sitting up or lying down. I prefer to have them sitting up if possible when inspecting the cardiac area. <clears throat> All right, here are the five cardiac areas, and I want to go over these in detail with you because when you do your video assessments for us, you need to tell us the landmarks. You need to kind of commit these to memory. You're going to need to know these from here on out and be able to identify these for the nursing program and on your assessment. You should be um, palpating, lightly palpating, and auscultating these five areas on each of your clients. All right. So the aortic, it says second ICS to the right of the sternum. So there's a few little um, uh, abbreviations we use, but you're going to pick those up real quick. So the aortic area, if you go over here, this is the aortic area. It's at the second intercostal space to the right of the sternal, sternum or on the right of the sternal border. If you go right across the sternum, on this side, that is the pulmonic area. That is the second intercostal space to the left of the sternum. Herbs point, that is the third intercostal space to the left of the sternum. The tricuspid area, which is to the, it's either the fourth or fifth, depending on a client's anatomy, intercostal space just to the left of the sternum. And the mitral area, which is the fifth intercostal space just to the right of the mid clavicular line so when you're looking at your client it's a really important to I kind of like to feel inside their um, fill fill inside their ribs kind of fill in between the ribs to make sure I'm in the right spot if you look here you have your first rib here's your clavicle your clavicle the first rib comes just right up underneath the clavicle and then there's a big space and then there's a second space that second space is where you're going to find your aortic and across the sternum is going to be your pulmonic below that's going to be herbs below that will be your um, tricuspid and if you go to here's your clavicle mid clavicular is right here and you take that down and it says just to the right of it, I generally go just about mid-clavicular because sometimes it may be just a little to the right or a little bit to the left or just right on it is going to be your mitral area. Generally, again, that's going to be depending on the anatomy of your client, but it should be right in that area in the mid-clavicular line. So memorize this, star this um, slide because you need to be able to memorize your um, five cardiac sites. <coughs> All right, so we're still inspecting at this point though, and um, inspecting, we are looking for any pulsations or heaves. Again, any pulsation other than that, that mitral area, which is the fifth intercostal space to the left or to the right of that, right in that midclavicular line, 
might indicate that there's an increased cardiac workload or mechanical problem or medical problems, excuse me, with the heart. Um, if you think about it, that is where the apex of the heart is or where the ventricles kind of come together, where the little, you know, the bottom of the heart is. I mean, that really is where the, the, the biggest part of the muscle is in the heart. That's what's doing all the work. Um, so if somebody does have some cardiac disease, frequently that's kind of where we're going to see it. And if the heart's working harder, it's usually going to be in those two ventricles. Um, and that's typically where we're going to see it as that the pulsation and heave in that general vicinity. All right. Um, that apical pulse, the mitral area, or the point of a maximum impulse, they can all really be used interchangeably. Um, again, that's still going to be that same area at the apex, the fifth intercostal space, midclavicular line. That's what we call the PMI or the point of maximum impulse. Um, again, that's where the heart's going to be pumping um, the strongest or where you're going to be able to see it the strongest at that area. So we need to inspect for the placement that, that the apex of the heart is exactly there where it should be, just to the left of the intercostal space um, on that uh just left of that intercostal space on that uh, midclavicular line. It's just right in that midclavicular line area. Again, it may move just a little bit. If that is offset one side or the other, we are concerned that the heart's been working um, really hard for a really, really long time. Um, <clears throat> the heart is a muscle. Anytime you overwork a muscle, it tends to get a bit, a little bit larger, just like any other bot muscle in your body. But if it's really having to work really hard to function, um, <clears throat> that point of maximum impulse will be moved off slightly because they get thickening of the muscle and the heart muscle. Um, so that's why we tried to kind of inspect the spot to where it should be and make sure that PMI is exactly where it should be. If it's displaced, we're worried that there's been some long-term disease or some long-term problems going on. Um, <clears throat> again, PMI is also referred to as the mitral area. And it's also where we're going to get that apical pulse from. If we ever ask you, and we will, you should be getting an apical pulse, pulse on your clients. You're going to listen for 60 seconds and you're going to um, do it at that place right there at that fifth intercostal space midclavicular line. So apical pulse, apical area, my, um, the uh, mitral area. Um, <clears throat> point of maximal impulse, you can really kind of interchange those terms depending on um, what book you're reading or um, what lecture it is. <clears throat> I'm so sorry. Um, pulsation heaves and thrills. Pulsations are a tapping feeling. Heaves are a more forceful thrust. Thrills are a vibratory sensation, kind of like a little bit of vibration. Usually it's from blood filling um, a valve or filling a... Um, a um, a chamber of the heart really forcefully. Um, again, you're going to inspect all the areas of the heart, and then you'll go and palpate those five cardiac areas. Again, you should not feel anything except at that mitral area, possibly. Um, <clears throat> again, that PMI, again, just a soft vibratory tapping sensation at that left of the fifth intercostal space, just to the right of the midclavicular line, uh, that left midclavicular line. Um, <clears throat> It should not be any larger than one to two centimeters of, of a lift at the most. If it's any larger than three centimeters or three centimeters or larger, that's really considered a heave. And we would really be concerned that there might be some um, left ventricle hypertrophy, or again, where that left ventricle muscle gets really thick um, and from being overworked or some other cardiac underlying disease, which we'll talk about more when you get into nursing school. But we're just worried that there's some cardiac disease going on there and it's been going on so long that it's affected the muscle and it's um, kind of off, set off, off place that uh, PMI. All right, for carotid arteries, we're gonna auscultate for brewies. And that's, I know it's, there's a, D, a T in there, but that is not pronounced as brewy. Um, we have them hold their breath because if you listen to tracheal sounds previously, you'll notice that they're very loud and very, very high pitched. Um, and we should also be using a bell with this. So if you look at her, she's holding her stethoscope to where she's got the bell against the carotid artery. Um, and a brewery sounds like a swishing sound. So we'll take our stethoscope and we will listen one at a time for each carotid. And then we'll palpate the carotids one at a time. 
The pulses should be equal but not bounding, but you would never want to palpate the carotids at the same time. And I want to repeat that. You would never palpate the carotids at the same time. There's an underlying disorder for frequently that happens in some patients with cardiac disease called carotid sinus reflux. Um, there are little receptors on the carotid arteries and sometimes when stimulated it can cause the heart to slow down and so what happens if they are stimulated at the same time it can cause the patient to get a dangerously low heart rate or it could even cause their heart to stop so you're always going to palpate the carotids one at a time never bilaterally All right, those five, uh, or we're gonna auscultate the, that apical pulse. Um, so we listen at that fifth intercostal space, mid clavicular line, and we're gonna listen there for a full minute. You're gonna evaluate the rate, which is how fast is it going per minute. So you're gonna count the, how many beats per minute. And not only that, but the, the rhythm as well. Is it regular? It should be fairly regular for a normal healthy adult. There might be a slight um, speeding up or slowing down if somebody takes a deep breath, um, because as the lungs inflate, it does tend to make the heart slow down a little bit, um, <clears throat> just because of the space within the thoracic cavity. Um, the rate is going to change with age. If you have a pediatric client, it's going to be a lot faster. Um, general adults are going to be somewhere between 60 and 100. If you have someone who is a runner or an, um, does a lot of cardiac or cardiovascular exercise, they may have much lower pulse rates. My son, if you saw in the demonstration video, is extremely thin. He used to be a marathon runner. He hasn't done it for a few years, but at rest, his heart rate would go down into the 40s. He was um, very, he has a very, very efficient heart rate, um, and but that was normal for him. Um, so again, look at your client, but for most adults, it's going to be somewhere between 60 and 100. <clears throat> You don't have to memorize all the pediatric variations because they vary widely depending on age. Um, generally, we have a chart that you'll have to refer to even in, even when you're working in um, the nursing program itself. They'll have a chart for you to refer to for um, heart rate for your, um, for your pediatric clients. All right. Um, we also like to see if there's any type of what we call a pulse deficit. So while you're listening to the apical area, feel for a pulse in the wrist, which is done on the side of where the thumb is. If you notice here, she's got her fingers there on the thumb side of her wrist. You're going to feel for a pulse at the same time you're listening at that apical area. And ideally, the pulse that you feel in the wrist and what you hear in the chest should be synchronous or should be happening at the same time. If it's not, that indicates that there's a pulse deficit. And again, there may be some underlying cardiac disease. All right, and then we're going to auscultate each of those other um, cardiac areas for any extra sounds, heartbeats, and murmurs. Um, we go through with the bell first, and then we follow with the diaphragm. diaphragm. Certain sounds and tones fill or sound better with the bell, and then others sound better with the diaphragm. I feel that it's easiest to get my j basic heart tones with the diaphragm, and if there's abnormal things going on, like murmurs or clicks, I can usually pick those up better with the bell. But the diaphragm is usually my go-to piece. So use the bell and the diaphragm, all five cardiac areas. While the client is sitting up um, or lying, we, I, again, I prefer sitting up if it's safe to do so. Um, <clears throat> That's when we would um, ideally do this. There, We may have the client lean forward at one point, and I'll talk more about that here in just a minute. It says use a sequence starting at either the base or the apex of the heart. So the base is considered the top. The apex is considered the bottom where the ventricles kind of meet at the very at the little V at the bottom of the heart. Um, generally, most people start with the aortic area. And it goes aortic, pulmonic, <clears throat> your herbs point, tricuspid, and then your mitral. Herbs point is not always listened to. Um, typically, herbs point is only really um, addressed 
when we um, have clients that have a history of uh, inflammatory disorders, um, which I'll talk about here in a minute. Um, but for the purposes of this course, you will listen for herbs point um, on your client. So you're gonna, again, you're going to use a sequence starting at either the base or the apex of the heart. I suggest starting at the aortic area. And then um, if you're having trouble listening to the sound, have them lean forward and turn a little bit to the left side. Why does leaning forward and to the left help? Is because the heart is in the um, left side of the chest. And if you have them lean forward, it's going to put the heart closer to the chest wall. And if you leave it over to the left, it's going to let it um, sit against the chest wall a little bit um, and make the sounds of the heart tones um, that will make them a little bit more pronounced. So the first sound you're listening for is S1. That is the lub. And the sound that you're actually hearing, it's the valves closing. That's the tricuspid and mitral valve that are actually closing. And if you have to review your um, anatomy, you know, Google a picture, but there's valves inside the heart there, um, right before the ventricles, it's the tricuspid and the mitral, that sound, the lub, that's those valves closing. You should hear it in all of the cardiac areas, all five, but it should be the loudest intensity at that mitral and tricuspid area, which again is in that lower section of the heart. Um, it should be synchronous with the carotid pulse. So if you're feeling for a pulse and listening for the lub, that's at the same time as the lub dub. Um, splitting. What is splitting? It's a splitting may occur, but it may be physiological or pathological or refer to a physician. Um, honestly, at this point, if you're, you're a novice nurse or even a nursing student, if you hear something irregular, um, it's probably best just to either ask your instructor or ask the primary nurse. Um, because it's very difficult to identify sounds when you're first starting out. But what's important is that we do understand what sounds normal. So if we know what normal sounds like, when we hear something abnormal, even though you may not be able to identify it, you've identified that there's something there that doesn't belong. And you can talk to someone, review the history, talk to someone and, and kind of learn about those sounds. But we're going to talk a little bit more about that. So it's very important that you try to find out what is normal, what normal heart sounds sound like. Okay. But the splitting, what that means, I kind of got off sidetracked, is when the valves are not closing at the same time. That's that tricuspid and mitral valve. It's like when they're a little bit off, they're not quite as synchronous. And so you'll have a little, like a little, um, um, little extra tone in there. Um, that's called splitting. Um, <clears throat> and I do have some cardiac sounds. I will try and pull up for you. Um, I will try and, um, get those posted if they're not in there already, but I'll, um, find them and I'll get them for you. Um, <clears throat> so that is the splitting. Um, and again, if you hear something abnormal, it's just best to get your instructor or, uh, ask the primary nurse about it. The S2 is the dub. Remember your heartbeat goes lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. That's kind of the lub dub. The dub is going to be the aortic and the pulmonic valves that are closing. Again, you can hear it in all five of cardiac areas, but because the aortic and the pulmonic valves are in the top part of the heart, that's where you're going to hear it the loudest. Um, you're going to hear S2 loudest in the aortic and pulmonic area, and you're going to hear the S1 loudest at the tricuspid and mitral area. Um, that's going to be important. It's probably going to be a test question. And again, you may have some splitting here where these valves do not close exactly at the same time. Um, again, if you hear something abnormal, just ask someone or refer it to physician or talk to your nursing instructor or talk to the primary nurse. All right, there are a couple of heart tones in every normal, um, healthy adult. You're going to hear S1, S2. There are times when you hear something called an S3 or an S4. These are fairly common um, heart tones that may be heard due to, um, it may be an underlying condition or it might just be normal for this particular person depending on what's going on. Like if it's a child or a pregnant female, sometimes because of the extra volume, you may have extra tones. So an S3, again, in most normal healthy adults, you're not going to hear an S3. Um, you, 
may hear it in a child or in a young adult, but as they get a little bit older and it reach adulthood, that S3 kind of goes away. You hear it in early dia diastole, and that's kind of when the vessels are at most rest, at the apex of the heart, so down there by the ventricles, um, with that tricuspid and mitral area, um, and you would hear it with the bell. And again, it's normal in young children and adults, or young adults. Um, and it's usually caused because there's so much blood being filling the ventricles really quickly. In older adults, it's because there's a problem with that ventricle stretching, and it's causing a vibratory sensation down there. But that's called an S3, and so we call that S3 a ventricular gallop, because again, you're going to hear it more down by the ventricles. And it has the word there, Kentucky. Now, what does that mean? Um, again, we kind of, to be able to identify an S3, because there's S3 and S4, it has the beat, as we were to say the word Kentucky or the state Kentucky, um, the way that the syllables kind of roll off of the tongue, that's similar to how the beat of the, um, of what you would hear, what you would auscultate. I'm trying to, it's a little bit easier to explain this in class. Um, <clears throat> yeah, remember your S1 and S2 are lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. The S3, on the other hand, is going to sound like when you talk, when you say Kentucky, 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 bum, 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 bum. That's what an S3 sounds like. I'm trying to kind of spit it out. And I'm sure there's some other videos that have um, a better, um, more graphics than whatever that I have access to. But again, the S3 sounds like Kentucky, Kentucky, bum, 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 bum. That's what an S3 would sound like. Okay. And then brings us to S4, which is the fourth heart tone. Um, again, that would occur in late diastole, just before the S1, so right before the lub. And again, that's because there's some resistance to the ventricular filling. Um, <clears throat> we call this one the atrial gallop. And I guess both of these, the S3 and the S4, are heard best at the base of the heart. But this one's called the atrial gallop <clears throat> versus your um ventricular gallop this is called ventricular gallop s3 atrial gallop s4 and this one if you're to hear it it sounds like tennessee which again if you say tennessee it's tennessee tennessee bum 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 that's a little bit different than kentucky kentucky bum 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 it has a little bit of a different beat to it so that's why we have Kentucky versus Tennessee. Kentucky is your S3. Tennessee is your S4. <gasps> oh, sorry, I had to sneeze. <clears throat> okay. Hope I was able to cut that out of there. All right. So S1, S2, normal in every healthy adult. Um, if you have a pediatric client or a young adult, you might hear an S3. Um, typically, S3 and S4 in adults, unless they are pregnant, are considered abnormal but they're not really that uncommon so again if you hear any extra heart tones or any extra noises when you're doing your uh, cardiac assessment on your clinicals it's just probably best until you are able to differentiate what different sounds are because it's very difficult to learn and we completely understand that just to ask your instructor <clears throat> All right, so murmurs. Uh, murmurs are turbulent blood flow within those heart chambers. Um, sometimes it's caused by leaky vessels or leaky valves, not leaky vessels, leaky valves or vibrating valves. Um, you may hear like a swishing or a blowing sound, and sometimes they're really loud. Usually a murmur is the first thing that a student picks up on that's abnormal um, because some of them are pretty easy and they're not that uncommon. And you may hear them at any time during the cardiac cycle. Um, it's best heard with the bell. And then we grade this as like a one through a six. And I believe this may be a test question. So you might want to star this slide as well. Uh, numbers one through six. And if, for instance, you document it as a three versus six, we do not expect you to document murmurs at this point. But what we do expect that you... Um, if you were reading a chart, if your physician documented a murmur at a two out of six or a five out of six, that you would know what that meant. And there is a chart here, a grading scale 
Um, <clears throat> grade one is barely audible, very, very faint, very, very light. You could hardly hear it unless you have a, a nice trained ear. Up to grade six, which you may not even need a stethoscope, but if you put your ear to the chest, you might be able to hear it all by itself. Um, so one is very faint, faint. Six is very, very loud. That's the grading skill of the murmur. So again, I think there may be a test question kind of about the uh, grading skill here. <clears throat> so it might kind of uh, star this slide as well. Pericardial friction rubs. If you remember a couple of modules ago, I can't remember, I discussed that there is, um, uh, you have pleura like sacs uh, that kind of line the lungs to, so it lubricates so the lungs can move and um, breathe free, freely or move freely without causing friction because there's a little bit of a lubricant in it. Same thing with the heart. They have a pericardial sac. The heart sits in the pericardial sac. There's a lubricant in that sac. So that way as the heart beats, it's lubricated and it moves freely so it doesn't rub against the other organs. Um, <clears throat> sometimes that sac though on certain individuals um, that have in, like um, autoimmune disorders or that cause an increase in uh, inflammation in, in the body, uh, particularly disorders like lupus, um, sometimes it causes a significant amount of inflammation in that pericardial sac. And what you'll hear is that the heart rubs against the sac a little bit. And you hear a little rubbing sound when they're having a lot of inflammation. Um, so that is called a pericardial friction rub. Again, you can hear it really, it says during systole or diastole, you can hear it really at any time. Um, the sound is usually louder when we have the client sitting up and leaning forward. Again, when the heart is leaning forward the front of the chest and maybe even a little bit over to the left because um, it kind of pushes the heart out um, against that chest wall. And the best place to hear this really is going to be at that herbs point um, because that's like right in the meaty part of the heart um, and right in between those intercostal spaces and you're going to listen to it with the diaphragm because generally it's a little bit of a lower tone, um, lower pitch tone um, to listen to. That's called a pericardial friction rub and again the best way to describe it is if you take your hair and you rub it in between your ears it just sounds a very faint rubbing sound. Um, and when you get into clinical, if you do have anybody that has lupus or a history of one of those autoimmune disease, diseases, um, you might consider um, listening to that herbs point really thoroughly to see if you can hear anything because it is very faint. Um, and the first time you pick one up, it's, you know, um, you, students usually get pretty excited if they're able to do that. All right, that is it for the uh, cardiac area. I'm sorry about my allergies today. I've had to like pause the recording a few times. Hopefully I was able to cut out a lot of that stuff. Um, here, I encourage you to fill this out, memorize those cardiac sites. Remember, you got your first intercostal space, um, your second intercostal space, you're gonna have your aortic, your pulmonic, um, your herbs point, tricuspid, your mitral area, look right there where the apex of the heart is, where the ventricles meet at the very bottom, um, midclavicular line, fifth intercostal space. Take this, and I want you guys to memorize this, um, memorize those spots, because you need to identify those landmarks when you're doing your assessments on your clients. Um, for your video and also when you start the nursing program. Um, this is something you just need to commit to memory from here on out, okay? Um, if you want the concept mapped, it's also right here for you. Um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. Um, and I think that is probably about all I have for this. I will start to record the uh, peripheral assessment here in just a moment. Thanks.